Hey everyone, welcome to this video on vectors and components. If you haven't watched it yet, you'll want to watch the video on trigonometry and trig functions before watching this video, or you'll at least want to have a good understanding of the trig functions first. So in this video, we'll answer the question, what is a vector? We'll learn how to find the components of a vector, and we'll talk about choosing your coordinate system based on different problems that we might be solving. So first, what is a vector? A vector is something that has both a magnitude and a direction. We usually represent a vector using an arrow, and the length of the arrow is the vector's magnitude. So here we have this blue vector with a magnitude of 5 meters and a direction of 30 degrees above the positive x-axis. We use vectors to represent a lot of different things in physics. We might deal with vectors that represent the displacement of an object. We could use vectors to represent the velocity of an object that's moving. We'll use force vectors all of the time when we draw the free body diagram for an object or when we calculate the torque around some pivot point. And we can even use vectors to represent the momentum of objects when we're working with collisions and the conservation of momentum. So there are two ways to define a vector. The first way, like we mentioned before, is by using the magnitude and the direction. Here we have this blue vector with a magnitude or length of 100 meters and a direction of 30 degrees above the positive x-axis. This combination of magnitude and direction completely describes this specific vector. No other vector could have the same magnitude and direction. The second way to define a vector is by using its two components. If we create a right triangle with the vector as the hypotenuse of the triangle, the other two sides become the components of the vector. Here we have an x component of 87 meters and a y component of 50 meters. Since right triangles always have one angle that is 90 degrees, they're sort of partially constrained already, and it turns out that we can fully define this blue vector using only these two other sides. No other vector could be created by using these two components. Next, let's learn how to find the components of a vector. So what exactly are components, and how can we think about them? I think the easiest way is to picture a map with a compass. Imagine you're hiking from point A to point B in a straight line, and you travel 15 miles. So now you're at point B, and you physically hiked 15 miles straight. But how far north of point A are you? Well, it turns out that you traveled 7.5 miles north of point A. And how far east of point A are you? Well, it turns out that you traveled 13 miles east of point A. So let's say you were lost and you called someone at point A to come and find you using a compass. You could tell them to travel 13 miles directly east and then 7.5 miles directly north. And they would take a different path, but they would still end up at point B. So in this example, the 15 miles straight from point A to point B is our displacement vector. And our components are 13 miles east and 7.5 miles north. And you can see how we've created a right triangle. So another way to think about components is to imagine the vector casting a shadow on each of the two axes. Let's say you're at the beach with an umbrella, and the sun was shining down across the whole beach. Your umbrella would create a shadow on the sand. But the shadow isn't the entire length of your umbrella. It's only the length of the umbrella that is blocking the sun from shining straight downwards and reaching the sand. The same thing is true for finding components of a vector along the x and y axes. If you had a light shining down parallel to the y axis, the vector would cast a shadow 
onto the x-axis. The length of this shadow is the vector's component along the x-axis, also known as the x-component. And if you shined a light sideways parallel to the x-axis, the vector would cast a shadow onto the y-axis. Again, the length of this shadow is the vector's component along the y-axis, also known as the y-component. So we can see here that the length or magnitude of the full vector itself is 100 meters. But the length of each shadow, meaning the length of each component, is less than 100 meters because the vector is at some angle relative to the x and y axes. Sometimes we say that the x component is the amount of the vector that's parallel with the x axis, or the amount of the vector that's aligned with the x axis. And the same thing is true for the y axis. Alright, so now that we know what the components are, how do we actually calculate them? This is where we'll need to know the right triangle trig relationships, which is something that we covered in a previous video. So every vector and its two components form a right triangle, where the magnitude of the vector is the length of the hypotenuse. In order to find the lengths of the other two sides, which are the components, we need to be given an angle. If this was the angle, then we would label the adjacent and opposite sides like this. And if we were given the other angle, the opposite and adjacent sides would just be flipped. But we're going to use the first angle. So here are the three trig functions that we know, sine, cosine, and tangent. For this right triangle, we're given the hypotenuse and an angle, and we want to find the adjacent side and the opposite side. The tangent function doesn't include the hypotenuse, so it's easiest if we just use sine and cosine. First, let's figure out the adjacent side length. For that, we're going to need the cosine function, which includes the adjacent side. If we rearrange this equation by multiplying both sides of the equation by the hypotenuse, then we get this. The hypotenuse times the cosine of theta equals the adjacent side. So let's label the adjacent side with that. Now let's find the opposite side. For that, we're going to need the sine function, which includes the opposite side. Just like before, we can rearrange this equation by multiplying both sides by the hypotenuse, and now we get this. The hypotenuse times the sine of theta equals the opposite side. So we'll replace the opposite side with that. To make this simpler, let's call the hypotenuse m for the magnitude of the vector. So in this case, the x component is m times the cosine of theta, and the y component is m times the sine of theta. However, if we were given the other angle, now the x component is m times the sine of theta, and the y component is m times the cosine of theta. This might seem like it can get a little tricky, but all you need to remember are the trig functions which will tell you which component is which based on the angle you're given. The opposite side from the angle is always m times the sine of theta, and the adjacent side to the angle is always m times the cosine of theta. So the last thing we'll talk about is choosing your coordinate system when setting up a problem and finding the vector components. Let's say we're given this vector with a magnitude of m. We could choose to set up a coordinate system like this. The coordinate system is just how we choose to position and orient the x and y axes. So using this coordinate system, the components for this vector would look like this. One is parallel to the x-axis and the other is parallel to the y-axis. Now, let's say we're given the exact same vector, but we choose a rotated coordinate system like this. We'll see later why we might want to do this. Now, the same vector would have components that look like this. Just like before, one is parallel to the x-axis and the other is parallel to the y-axis. These components look different than the ones on the left, but they create the exact same vector.
So what if we oriented our coordinate system so that the x-axis was pointing along the vector? Well, now the component along the x-axis is the same length as the vector itself because the vector is already parallel to the x-axis. And the y component for this vector would actually be zero. It wouldn't have any length. No amount of this vector is pointing along the y direction. And the trig functions still work here. If we said theta was the angle between the vector m and the x-axis, then theta would be zero degrees. The x component would be m times the cosine of theta, but since the cosine of zero degrees is one, then the x component would just be m times one, or m. And the y component would still be m times the sine of theta, but since the sine of zero degrees is zero, then the y component would just be m times zero, which is just zero. Okay, so why would we want to choose any of these weird coordinate systems? Well, it all depends on the problem that we're working with. The most common problem setup includes an object on a flat surface with some force vector being applied to it, maybe at an angle. Gravity points vertically downwards. The normal forces, which we'll learn point perpendicular to the surface, would be pointing upwards, and usually the motion is horizontal. So for this setup, it makes the most sense for us to choose a coordinate system where x and y are in the same direction as the forces, and more importantly, that either x or y is in the same direction as the object's motion. Using this coordinate system, the components for this vector would look like this. But sometimes we're going to work with problems where an object is on an incline at some angle. In this case, the normal forces are still perpendicular to the surface, and the object's motion is still parallel to the surface. So it'll be most useful for us to set up our coordinate system with the x-axis parallel to the object's motion. And as a third example, when we deal with forces that create a torque around some pivot point, we're going to break the force into components that are parallel and perpendicular to what we call the arm which in this case is a wrench. That'll help us figure out how much of the force vector is actually creating torque. So we'll use different coordinate systems for different problems, but in general, the coordinate system will be the most useful if one of the axes is in the same direction as the object's motion. That'll make a lot of sense when we learn about free body diagrams and adding forces together. Okay, so to sum it up, Here's how to find the components of a vector. Step one is to choose your coordinate system that will make your problem the easiest to solve. And again, this just means picking the orientation of your x and y axes, but it also means picking what direction is positive x and positive y. Step two is to draw a right triangle where the vector's magnitude is the hypotenuse. One side is parallel to the x-axis and the other side is parallel to the y-axis. Step three is to use the trig functions and the given angle to solve for the components. Remember that we can rearrange our trig functions to find that the adjacent side is the magnitude times the cosine of theta, and the opposite side is the magnitude times the sine of theta. And here's an important tip. Do not memorize if the x or y components are sine or cosine. It all depends on which angle is given. Just remember you have a right triangle, and adjacent goes with cosine, and opposite goes with sine. Let's do a quick recap. First, we learned what vectors are and the different types of vectors that we might use in physics. Next, we learned the two ways to define a vector either by using the magnitude and direction, or by using the two components. We talked about why we might choose to orient our coordinate system in different ways depending on the problem that we're solving. And we walked through and summarized how to find the components of a vector 
using right triangles and trig functions. So that's it for this video. Thanks for watching. And definitely ask a question or leave a comment below about the stuff we just covered or anything related to physics. And I'll see you in the next video.